Well, good afternoon and welcome back to another live Liquid Web webinar. My name is Nathan Ingram, and today we're going to be talking about a very important subject. If you are a freelancer or you work in some sort of an agency and you deal with clients, chances are you have experienced a problem client or two or 10 or 12 <laughs> over your experience in client work. Problem clients can be very difficult to work with. And we're going to talk about today some strategies that I'm calling building fences around friendly monsters. Uh, so again, my name is Nathan Ingram. I am from Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm the host at iThemes Training. iThemes is a liquid web company, and uh, at iThemes Training, we do webinars all week long about all sorts of web development topics. I personally have been working with web clients since 1995. I've been at this a long time, and uh, again, built and sold my first website well over 20 years ago, and uh, so I've seen just about all that you can see in the web business. I'm also a business coach for WordPress freelancers, and when it comes to problem clients, I'll say I'm an expert, uh, at least by the definition of Dr. Niels Bohr, a physicist, who said that an expert is a person who has found out by his own painful experience all the mistakes that one can make in a very narrow field. So by that definition, I am definitely an expert when it comes to dealing with problem clients because I've made all the mistakes that you can make uh, when it comes to allowing clients to run roughshod all over my business and all over my world. And as a result of that very painful experience, I've developed some systems and processes in my business that really help to keep those problem clients contained. So here's what we're going to be talking about for the next uh, oh, roughly an hour or so together. We'll be talking about this whole concept of friendly monsters. And uh, then we're going to look at how to build fences or build these systems and processes in your business that can help to protect you from those monsters. And last of all, we'll wrap up with five different monsters that you need to know and how to contain them using the strategies that we've talked about in the webinar today. So if you'd like to download the slides, you can do so right there at bit.ly slash lwmonsters. If you want to uh, just grab that link real quick and open up the slides, you can follow along, take notes if you'd like, but it's bit.ly slash lwmonsters. And if you want to tweet at us, you can do so. I am at Nathan Ingram and Liquid Web, of course, is at Liquid Web. So here's the basic idea. Clients are friendly monsters. The problem with a friendly monster and the problem with a client is that every client has the potential for transformation. They can be friendly at first, but even friendly monsters have teeth, just like our little monster guy there has. So we as business owners need to build fences, build business systems into what we do and how we do it in order to protect ourselves from these friendly monsters. Now, if you don't contain the monsters, and chances are you've learned this already in your uh, history working with web clients. If you don't complain the monsters, you're, you're going to end up wasting time, money, and emotional capital dealing with all the problems that these difficult clients can bring. And really, having this sort of a system that I'm going to describe in your business is really the difference between owning a job and truly owning a business. Even if you're a freelancer, even if you're only working part-time, it is so important that you develop consistent systems and processes in your business. It's going to make you more efficient, more effective, and more profitable, but it's also going to help to keep these problem clients in check. So there are four fences that I'm going to suggest that we need to build around our friendly monsters in order to keep them contained. And we need all four of these fences, otherwise the client just walks right out of one of them. Uh, the first fence is what I'm going to call clarity, and we're going to spend some time getting into each of these as we go. Clarity, the second is commitments, the third is communication, and the fourth is documentation. So we need these four fences present in our businesses in order to keep these friendly monsters contained. Clarity, commitments, communication, documentation. Let's start by talking about clarity. Now, clarity is, is critical because in my experience, the most 
common reason that client relationships suffer is a lack of clarity. A lack of clarity. Now, don't confuse agreement with clarity because there can be agreement without clarity. The legal term for that is no meeting of the minds. <laughs> a lot of times we, and as web professionals, can use technical jargon that really muddies the water. And you'll be talking about things that are crystal clear to you, but to the client, they're just sort of nodding their head, not wanting to look stupid, but they really don't understand what it is you're saying. And then sometimes, I'm not sure if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes clients don't tell you everything. Have you ever had a scenario where that's been the case? Where you get into a web project and the client drops a bomb on you that they've never talked about at all up to this point. Sometimes clients don't tell you everything. So when you have a situation like that, whose fault is it? If the client doesn't tell you everything, whose fault is it? I would suggest that it's at least 50-50. At least 50-50. Because you and I, as web professionals, need to develop the skills to ask the right questions so that we can extract from the client all of their expectations. And I'll tell you, if you can become really, really good at asking the right questions and drilling down, drilling down, drilling down until you get clarity, that skill, can, that skill alone can set you apart from your competition. It's so important to get to a point of clarity. Now, a lack of clarity oftentimes comes from assumptions. The client is assuming that you're gonna do some things and you're assuming that the client is gonna do some things and neither of you necessarily really have a point of agreement, a point of clarity, where you both realize exactly what each other is supposed to do. Assumptions can wreck a client relationship. So what I would encourage you to do is take a really hard look at your process. And you do have a process, right? Do you have a way that you build websites or run web projects for every client, every project, every time? Or are you like a lot of folks who maybe maybe you run every project just sort of by the seat of your pants and you, you have kind of a way that you do things roughly, but it's not necessarily consistent from project to project. And I would encourage you to really work hard to do a project the same way every time. And I'm going to give you an example of that in just a minute. But as you look at your process and you look at the way you build websites, whether it's absolutely consistent every time or whether you just sort of have a, a basic idea of how you do projects, if you look at that concept, where are the assumptions in your process? At what points during that process are you assuming the client is going to do something? Do they understand that? What is the client assuming you're going to do? Are those assumptions legitimate? Look at your process. Look at the way that you do every single project and figure out where those assumptions are and make sure that you have clarity between you and the client on all of those things. See, the key to clarity is specificity. There's some really simple tools that you can implement in your business to help this issue of clarity dramatically. A lot of times it can simply start with an intake form. Having a consistent process that you work with every client coming into your business is so important. Do you have a consistent checklist that you ask every time you meet with a client the first time? when you're trying to unpack what the project is that the client is wanting you to do. Having a consistent checklist that you run for every client meeting is absolutely critical because as, as soon as you start relying on your own memory to remember all the questions you're going to ask, I promise you, you're going to end up forgetting something. So keeping it consistent with a great checklist is so important. And then having a crystal clear scope of work for every project is also incredibly important. You know, one of the most common places that this issue of clarity and specificity falls off the tracks is the single issue that I have found every freelance web developer struggles with, and that is content. 
How many times have your, has your project been delayed because the client struggles to get content to you? And there might even be a lack of clarity on who's going to provide the content. As I speak to groups of web developers around the country uh, each year, you know, it is, I, I'll ask this question quite a bit in front of a room full of web developers. How many of you struggle with getting content from the client? Virtually every hand goes up. And so many times the client is expecting that, hey, I'm paying you to build the website, so you should write the content, right? It's just one of those assumptions that needs to be unpacked. We've got to get clarity on that. And then also having a good, clear contract that explains how the process for building a website works and what happens in different scenarios, like if the client delays six months getting you the content, what happens as a result of that? If the client doesn't pay, what happens as a result of that? Other scenarios that can come up so that all those things are covered in your contract, crystal clear, so that you have clarity. A good contract is a balance between expectations and consequences. It really helps to get clarity on what we can expect from each other. So getting to specifics a specific checklist as you intake every client, specific things in the scope of work of what is going to be covered in this project, a great contract that has specifically what's going to happen throughout the course of the project and what happens in different scenarios. Those things will bring clarity to your client relationship. So that's the first fence. We've got to have great clarity. The second fence is what I call commitments. Now, the longer I live, the more I realize that every single healthy relationship that I have is based on healthy commitments. I mean, I've been married now for well over 20 years, and, you know, it's all about commitment, right? A good, healthy relationship starts with healthy commitments. But have you ever thought about the client relationship in terms of commitment, mutual commitment? See, for me, for years... Really, the only commitment I asked of the client was to sign the check. And once the check was signed and I was getting paid to do the project, I would move heaven and earth to get that project finished. And a lot of times I would spend far too much time and take on far too much abuse from bad clients as a result of that. So there's got to be in this client relationship a balance of commitments on both sides. So what I would encourage you to do is look at your process that you use to build websites and ask yourself, where are the commitment points that I'm asking the client? Because from the start, your process really needs to include opportunities for the client to commit, not just at the beginning, but at key points along the way. Now I thought for a long time about how best to visually demonstrate this, and I came up with this idea of a board game. So this board game, if you will, represents a typical project process in my client work. So it all starts off with the first contact. This is when the client calls me on the phone and says, hey, so-and-so referred you to me, or hey, I found you on the web, or it's an email that comes in, hey, we found your website, we're looking for somebody to build a website for us, et cetera, et cetera. Can we meet, can we talk, what does a website cost? all those wonderful questions that clients tend to ask. Before I do anything else, before I spend any time with that client in a first meeting, I'm gonna give them my minimum price, which for me these days is $4,000 for a basic website. That's where client work starts for me. And I'll tell them that. Our, our websites start at $4,000 and go up based on the functionality of the website. And if they're in agreement, if they'll commit to that baseline price, then we'll go on to the next step, which is the initial client consultation. Now, throughout that process, and we've done a, a webinar here on Liquid Web about that as well, it's in the, the, on the resources page, uh, there's a whole process that I use to, to structure that initial client meeting, and it always ends up with a ballpark price. And I'll say something along the lines of, Mr. Client, Mrs. Client, uh, based on what we've talked about today, what you're describing is a website between, let's just say, five and $6,000. If I write a proposal for you that is in that price range, are you ready to start? And so I don't even write the proposal until the client has bought into some ballpark price. 
Otherwise, what happens is you end up spending an hour or two hours or three hours on a proposal agonizing over your price point and you finally come in at a good price point and the client is thinking, yeah, but I was really looking for something around 500 bucks. They weren't even in the right ballpark. So before I even spend the time to write a proposal, I'm going to let the client commit to a price range. Now, once the client uh, receives the proposal in the contract, the ball is in their court. And uh, they now have to make the big commitment, which is signing a check for half up front and signing the contract document. Once that, we move into the content phase. Now, I'll tell you, this is the single biggest uh, change that I made to my business in the last five years or so that has made great difference. And that is moving the content stage to the beginning of the project. The next thing that happens after the client sends back the signed proposal and the, and the contract, they're going to get a content guide from us and then we don't move an inch until we have all the content for the website. All the text, all the assets, the photo, the video, testimonials, bios for the staff, whatever the site needs to have, we don't move another inch until all of that content is received. See, that way, if the client delays six months, you know what? That's fine. Uh, we do have some verbiage in our contract about suspended and abandoned projects uh, that's sort of beyond the scope of this webinar, but if the client, you know, they're going to give us half up front, and if it takes them that long, it's fine. We're not wasting any of our time building something that we have to rebuild because they're laid on content. But as soon as the, the client comes back with their part of the commitment, which is we've supplied the content, we then move into the design phase where we actually start to show them some visuals. We ask the client to sign off on those visuals, and when they do, again, that's their commitment. See how it's a balance of back and forth? I commit to give them some time at a consultation if they commit to a base price. I commit to put the time in to build a proposal if they commit to a ballpark price. We don't do anything else until they've given a big commitment, which is getting the content. Then we spend time doing some design and they commit back to us with a, an approval of the design. Then we move into the development phase. Once the design is approved, once the content is in, we just go in the cave and build the website, right? We're head down building the website. Once it's finished, we move into review and testing where the client looks at what we've done and makes any change requests. That's their commitment back to us. And then once they've signed off on it, we launch. We go through our launch process and then we move into a maintenance process where we're actually doing the regular maintenance of the website. So that's my process as a board game. But hopefully you can see within this process this idea of back and forth commitments. I commit to them, they commit to me, back and forth, back and forth. Healthy relationships are all about healthy commitments. Now, throughout that process, it's important that you clearly define expectations and consequences. These should be at strategic points in the development process. So if the client is delaying, delaying, delaying big time on the content, we're going to have some conversations about, you know, we have this in the, in the contract that you sign. We talk about, you know, if we're waiting more than 30 days, then some things are going to happen. Uh, so we, we're talking about this not only one time in the contract, but also regularly throughout the process of the project. We're reminding them of expectations and consequences. If you do this, then we do that. If you don't do this, then we don't do that. And it's important to do this, again, not just in the contract, which they may or may not fully read, but verbally and by email. And throughout the process of the contract, you're constantly reminding them of the commitments that they've made and that you're going to make. You know, you can tell some clients the same thing a hundred times, but they don't stay told. So it's important to do this over and over again and remind them. So we've talked about clarity. We've talked about commitments. Now let's talk about the third fence, which is communication. There's a great quote from George Bernard Shaw that says, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has occurred. And I find that to be so true with client work. But I also tell you that there are few things that can improve the client's experience with you more than clear, regular communication. There's another thing that can set you far apart from other developers and your competition is to become great at communicating with your clients. Uh, 
Because what happens is, if you're not regularly communicating with your clients, they're going to start making assumptions, and usually, in my experience, they assume the worst. So, <laughs> be honest. If you're building a website, and you hit a problem, are you more likely to be transparent with the client and communicate with them and say, you know, we've hit some problems this week, you know, we're a little bit behind of where we wanted to be, this is what's going on, this is how we're gonna solve it, or do you just sort of go hide in a cave and hope the client doesn't call? <laughs> because chances are you're in the latter category. That's a very natural response for us. But what I would encourage you to do is to become a better communicator with your client. Become a master of what I call the three sentence email. This is something I do every single week on Friday afternoons. With every active project that we have going, I send an email to that client. It's a th basically a three sentence email with a very simple outline. It's past, present, and future. Past, this is what we did on your project this week. Present. This is where things are now in terms of the project. Future, this is what we'll be doing next week. And if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to email. Invite communication. This email is the place to explain any problems that you encountered. So for example, let's say you're building a WooCommerce website and you're having problems making the, the UPS API connect so that you can get shipping rates all set up, right? And you're having crazy trouble with that and something's weird. This is where you explain to the client, you know, this week we've been working on getting the UPS integration. We've hit a few snags. We're working through it. Uh, we should have this wrapped up next week. Just tell the client what's going on. It's much better to be transparent and let them know where things are in terms of the project than it is to just go hide in a cave and hope the client doesn't call or email. It's much better for the relationship. Now, don't overshare, but just communicate. Let the client know what's going on. So we've talked about clarity, commitments, communication. Now the fourth fence is documentation. And this, again, is critical. If you don't document, you're relying on your own memory, or worse, the client's memory. <laughs> so how are you at documentation? If you have a verbal meeting with the client, either over the phone or face-to-face, -face, do you record that somewhere? Do you document it? Get used to communicating in writing because written communication is referenceable. So if you make a decision verbally, either in a call or in a meeting, what you do is you email the client to confirm that decision. And the email sounds something like this. Dear Mr. Client, Mrs. Client, enjoyed our call today. This email is just to confirm that we decided to do one, two, three, and four. Signed your name. Document. And I would encourage you to implement some sort of system that can easily capture all project communication. Now, there's lots of systems out there for this. We live in a wonderful time where there are 5,800 different web options for capturing communication. <laughs> Probably not, but close. I mean, there's Basecamp, there's Teamwork, there's Evernote, there's Asana, there's your choice of a CRM. What I would encourage you to do is don't just use email. Have some sort of system that captures all of your project communication. Now, the tendency that we all have as geeks, and I use that word lovingly, is that we will identify a problem. I need to capture all communication about a project. And we will research and research and research, and maybe we'll build some sort of elaborate solution and then never use it. <laughs> See, the best system is one that you will use consistently. Even if it's a little clunky, even if it's not the best technical solution, if it's one that you will consistently use and you know you'll use it and it works to record and document, use it. So clients are friendly monsters and we have to keep them contained. 
with clarity, commitments, communication, and documentation. All those four fences are vital. Now, before we move on to the next section, which is five different monsters that you need to be aware of, let me just give you one more little piece of advice, and that's this. Don't tear down your own fences. And let me explain what I mean by that. If you've put the time in to start to build some of these systems into your business, and you've got some great things that build clarity, and you've got your process down where there's good back and forth commitments, and you're communicating well, and you're documenting very well, here's what might happen. And this is especially true if you are what you would consider to be a nice person. If you're a nice person, be sure that you listen to what I'm about to say here. Because nice people tend to let clients weasel out of the commitments that they make. And then we tend to do something crazy, which is we make excuses for our clients. You build some fences, you've got a process in place, and then a client comes in and breaks the rules. The tendency is to be nice and give the client another chance. What I want to tell you is you can hold the client to his or her commitment and still be a nice person. They've made a commitment. We've got clarity. We've got an agreement. There's a signed paper. We need to hold them to their commitments. And don't break your own rules. Don't tear down your own fences. Because here's what's going to happen. A client breaks a rule. And then you decide, well, we're going to let them weasel out of that commitment. We're going to be nice and give them another chance. And, and initially, you feel good about that. Oh, I'm so good at customer service. But then here's what happens. I would just about bet you, and perhaps this resonates with you as I'm explaining it. What happens is, you, and you, initially, you feel good about it. But then you start to build resentment for that client. Down deep inside, this little fire starts, and you start to get a little angry about the fact that this client has taken advantage of you. And maybe it doesn't happen immediately, but clients who break the rules aren't just going to do it once. They're going to do it over and over again. And if you're nice over and over again and don't hold into their commitments, what happens is you're sitting there at your desk, you're getting more and more frustrated at this client, and then you leave your desk, you go back home, and then you're mean to everybody else in your life because of what this client did to you, because you let the client weasel out of their commitment. So you're mean to your spouse, you're mean to your kids, you're mean to the dog. <laughs> Instead of forcing a stranger to live with the consequences they've earned, we take it out on the people closest to us, and that is insane. But for years, I'm ashamed to admit, I did that. I don't do it anymore. But if you're a nice person, be sure you build strong fences and don't tear them down. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's move on to the next section of the presentation, which is five monsters that you really need to know and how to contain them. Now, there are great clients out there, by the way. I, I really truly do have some excellent clients that I've worked with for a long time. But there are also some terrible clients out there who don't care about you, they don't treat you fairly, they walk all over you if you let them. That's why we have to build the fences. And it's so important to do all that fence building work so these misbehaving clients don't trample all over the rest of your life. So let's look at how we can take these four fences and apply them to some specific client instances. And I wanna introduce you to the first of five monsters that I call the invisible man. Now, chances are, if you've worked with clients at all for any length of time, you have encountered the invisible man. Now, here's the, here are the invisible man's monster marks. How do you know if you're dealing with an invisible man? Well, the invisible man expresses interest and then disappears unexpectedly. Like, you'll go back and forth with them by email, they're interested, they're interested, this sounds great, and then they disappear. Or you have a call or two and things are going well and then boom, they're gone. They dropped off the face of the earth. You can't find them. Emails go unreturned. Calls go unreturned. This person might even 
plan a meeting and then reschedule it or not show. Or they might just take a really long time to respond. Like they're super interested, you send them an email and then it's three weeks before you ever hear from them again. Have you ever met an invisible man? <laughs> Chances are you have. Now what I've learned about this particular client type is that the invisible man is usually well-intentioned but busy. This is typically a lot of times it's a small business owner. And if you know anything about small business owners, if you are a small business owner, you know that the small business owner wears about 15 different hats. And today the website might be a top priority, but tomorrow there's a burning fire that has to be put out. So when the invisible man goes dark, something has happened and the website is no longer a top priority. Now, what you have to realize here is that the invisible man does not change once he signs your contract. If the invisible man is being an invisible man before the contract, trust me, he doesn't change. He's going to disappear on you again during the, pro during the project. The invisible man is going to tend to disappear and then sometimes, I might even say oftentimes, reappears with unreasonable demands when the timing gets critical. That's when the invisible man turns into what I call the stealth bomber and he appears out of nowhere and drops bombs all over your world. Because now all of a sudden the website is a priority again and maybe we're super close to a deadline that you may or may not have known even existed. And because he disappeared, now he wants you <laughs> to rush, rush, rush and get the project done. Chances are you, if you've been in the web business for any length of time, you've met this client. And I used to get so angry at these clients. And I would ask myself, why are they doing this to me? And the answer to that question is, they're doing this to me because I let them. So how do you contain an invisible man? The most important fence for the invisible man is clarity. When you're dealing with an invisible man, focus on clarity. Make sure they understand the process, both with a crystal clear contract and in verbal or email reminders. In your process and in your contract, you need clear verbiage on what happens when the client disappears. In my contract, I call that suspended and abandoned projects. And there's certain thresholds that happen. For example, if a client goes dark on us 30 days and we're waiting 30 days and the client hasn't produced what they needed to produce, either the content or a sign off on the design or whatever in, my, in, in our website process, if they go dark, then immediately that project is considered suspended and a few things happen. Number one, it goes to the bottom of the pile. Number two, the client then owes 100% of the balance of the project before we do anything else. And they have to give us what we've been waiting on. It won't be until those two things happen that we actually pick up the project again. And there's some other time uh, positions in there where different things happen. Ultimately, in our contract, we have abandoned projects which after 180 days, if they're still silenced, then the project is completely abandoned. Now there's some other stops during that process, but ultimately the client can abandon the project and lose everything they've invested thus far. But again, it's all about communicating with the client, being very clear on what the, what's going to happen if they continue to stay dark. We do that in the contract, we do that in verbal and email reminders. So you need that clear wording in your contract that describes projects delayed by the client. And you've got to hold them to the consequences that their behavior warrants. If you don't, you're training them to misbehave even more. You're creating a monster yourself. So there's an example of how the clarity fence can help to contain the invisible man. And we got to have those things, otherwise problem clients don't stay contained and they trample all over the areas of your life. Okay, the second monster that I want you to be aware of is what I call the question mark. Now, the question mark has no idea what he wants. Or he wants everything. Or he says, 
I'm not quite sure what I want, but I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> I hate that phrase. Question mark asks endless questions. He has no budget. He has no goals. Perhaps you've met a question mark. These clients are classic time wasters. So when it comes to containing the question mark, you got to focus on commitment. Commitment is the containment strategy that best works, in my experience, with the question mark. Because if you're trying to be a nice person, you could find yourself investing hours of your time in them before they ever even think about making a commitment to you. So what does that look like? This is where we get back to an intake form. Whenever you commit to sitting down with a client and working through the questions that you need to know to generate a proposal, you commit to them for an hour. And that's it. And the purpose of that meeting is not to answer a million questions. It's to gather information to create a proposal. The purpose of that meeting is not for them to daydream because the question mark loves just thinking about the possibilities about his or her business. And they'll ask a hundred questions and they don't have the answers to any of them. And they're hoping that maybe you do and that you'll give it to them for free. The next thing I would suggest as you're dealing with a question mark is to get to price early. Now, what I've learned a long time ago is that the best way to contain a question mark is with a dollar sign. To work with me, the minimum price is blank. Because as soon as you put a dollar figure on the table, the question mark tends to shut up because it just got real. If this person has a bunch of questions that they need to have answered, that's where it's time to bring in a discovery phase where you sit down and work with this person to answer all their questions. And that discovery phase costs money. For example, a lot of times you'll find a question mark who wants to build an e-commerce site. They want to sell something and they're going to have the greatest e-commerce site the internet has ever seen. But they have no idea how they're going to price their stuff. They have no idea how they're going to ship it. They don't know how tax works. They don't know how ful the fulfillment process is going to work. So should you answer those questions for free? Absolutely not. That's where a discovery phase can come in, where you can help them think through that process and actually earn some money from it. Otherwise, you're going to end up answering all those questions, not billing a dime, and the client has not made any commitment back to you to work with you at all yet. So containing the question mark is all about getting to price early, using an intake form, controlling that conversation. Okay, the next client type is what I'll call the boundary buster the boundary buster. Now, chances are you may have met this one too. The boundary buster is the kind of client that sends 3 a.m. emails with a 7.30 follow-up. They insist on after-hours meetings. They work weekends and holidays. They expect you to as well. And they can't figure out why in the world you wouldn't want to work on your kid's birthday to do their little menial job. These are very difficult clients to work with. Now, when you deal with a boundary buster, it's all about communication. Clearly communicate how and when you work. You can usually pick up these boundary buster tendencies pretty early in the client relationship. When they're pushing you to do things that you don't normally do, it's a huge red flag that you're dealing with a boundary buster. And it's fine for you to say, you know what? I work during normal business hours. I do not work on weekends. I do not work on holidays. If you need me outside of those regular hours for a true emergency, it's going to cost more. It might cost double. Or how about this? Have you ever been sitting at home at night and maybe you're watching Netflix or whatever it is that you do and maybe it's 10 o'clock at night and an email pops in from a client. Oh, hey, can you just do this? Or hey, they need a quick answer to a question. And you just real quick on your phone, fire off a quick response to that question. And you're sitting there 
you pat yourself on the back because you've got such great customer service. But wait a minute, what have you just done? You just told the client that you work at night and they can email you at 10 o'clock and expect a response. You can train someone who isn't a boundary buster to be a boundary buster. You yourself can create a monster if you're not careful. So how do you deal with these people? Well, you set the tone in the initial meetings of how and when you follow up. And then don't break your own fences. Don't violate your own boundaries. Look, we're not meeting at night or on the weekends unless there are genuinely extraordinary circumstances. And don't break that fence. Don't break your own rules. Because the boundary buster is going to test all of your fences. Now, this is an excellent candidate for what I call a PETA surcharge. <laughs> PETA stands for pain in the asterisk. If I'm going to work with a boundary buster, it's going to be worth it. <laughs> We're going to charge extra to work with a difficult person like this. And quite frankly, sometimes if a person becomes a boundary buster in the course of the project, sometimes you have to fire the client. Just make sure you have that scenario covered in your contract. Otherwise, things can get ugly. So that's the boundary buster. Let's look at number four, which is the client that I call the penny pincher. The penny pincher. Now, the penny pincher wants an $8,000 website for $1,000. The penny pincher is overly concerned about cost. Now, good clients are concerned about cost too. All good business people should be concerned about cost. The, biz the, the difference is good clients want to be fair with you. They want to win-win. But the penny pincher doesn't respect you and he only wants what's good for him. They don't respect you or your work. Or And here's the big red flag. <laughs> Have you ever had a client that wants to pay you in equity? Oh, I've got this great idea for this business online. And if you'll just build the website, I'll give you 10% of all the sales that come through it. This is a million dollar idea. You'd be crazy not to take that. Let me tell you. I built and sold my first website in 1995. I've been working consistently with clients from 1995 until today. And I have never, ever, ever had an equity deal that worked out. Not once, not ever. Because what that person is essentially saying is, wait a minute, you want me to invest in your project that you don't even believe in enough to pay me to do the work? Something isn't right here. Watch out for those equity deals. So how do you deal with a penny pincher? You focus on clarity. Clarity. Be sure your scope of work is crystal clear because what's going to happen is the penny pincher is like a boundary buster within the scope of work. The penny pincher is going to try to bleed you dry and consider it a job well done. They're going to try to creep out that scope of work and get way more than what you planned on giving. Just remember, bad clients are never worth the hassle. You do not have to work with everybody. The penny pincher can be very difficult to deal with. All right, last but certainly not least is the drama queen. <laughs> I have one person that I'm coaching who calls these her diva clients. Oh, the drama queen. The drama queen, everything is an emergency. Her favorite word is now. It's got to be done now. We need this today. It's got to be done this week or the whole world is going to collapse. <laughs> or she worked with a previous developer who did everything wrong. I'll tell you, when you're meeting with a client, especially early on in the process, and they start complaining about previous developers who did everything wrong, that is a huge red flag. And you better stop and dig into that a lot. Now, 
I've been around the web development world long enough to know that there are some really knuckleheaded developers out there who do some really crazy, weird, strange things. Uh, we do a lot of rescue work for clients who started off with a knuckleheaded web developer and they've got a mess on their hands and we have to pick it up and deal with it. However, whenever a client starts complaining about this previous web developer who did everything wrong, I'm going to dig into it hard. I want to know exactly what that web developer did or didn't do because chances are you're dealing with a drama queen who is never going to be satisfied with anybody. And if you end up working with her, she's going to be complaining about you to some other poor developer in six months from now. So just be careful about those complaints. Some clients cannot be satisfied. And when you're dealing with a drama queen, the way to contain them is with a focus on documentation. The drama queen is the one who's going to whine and complain about why do we have to do things this way? And oh, can't you just make an exception? And oh, can't we do it this way instead? She's going to be the one who's going to try to wheeze a lot of the commitments that, that she's made. But stick to your system because system trumps drama every time. If you've got a way you do things, do them your way. This person, this client agreed to that process when they started the project with you. Just make sure you keep careful records when you deal with this kind of client because the drama queen will change her mind frequently and he'll forget all the previous decisions that he's made. This is the one where you better be sure that you are emailing to confirm the decisions that you made verbally so that written communication is referenceable. You can remind the drama queen that they made a commitment about this. We've already made a decision. If we go back on it, it's going to cost more. Unfortunately, there's a lot of these kind of people out there and they can really, really make your business a nightmare if you let them. So clients are friendly monsters and we have to contain them with four fences. Clarity, commitments, communication, documentation. Hopefully you've picked up a few tips along the way today to start to implement some of those fences in your business. Now we're going to pause for questions right here at the end. So if you have questions, please drop those into the GoToWebinar control panel um, in that questions area. Ask those and I'll be happy to field those questions as we're wrapping up today. And as you're thinking about those and typing those in, let me just leave you with this question. How strong are your fences today? Do you have really good practices of clarity? Are you really great at clarity with the client? Do you ask the client to make commitments at different points along your process? How's your communication? Do you regularly communicate with clients throughout the project? How about documentation? Are you good at that? Or is there room for improvement? How strong are your fences today? And then dream a little bit with me. How much better would your life be if you had consistent processes in your business that built strong fences to help keep those problem clients in check? You can do it. Every single person on this webinar has the ability to build these sorts of fences to contain these friendly monsters. So I hope you take some of these things and you'll use them in a practical sense in your business. Well, thanks for being with me for the last 50 minutes or so. We do have time for questions right now. So, and there's a few that have popped in. Again, the slide link is at bit.ly slash LW Monsters, the Liquid Web Monsters. Bit.ly slash LW Monsters. Download these slides if you would like. Uh, okay, a few questions have popped in here. So we'll do our best to ask those, uh, get those answered. Uh, Eli would like to know, will this presentation outline be available? Uh, yes. So Eli, you can down, or is it Ellie? I'm not sure which. Sorry about that. Download that here at bit.ly slash LW Monsters. You can download the slides as you saw them on the screen. <laughs> That's a great comment from Don. He says, you're really talking to my wrong way of doing business. Don, man, I'll tell you. Like I said, this has come from me doing it the wrong way for many, many years. So I feel your pain. Uh, web team is asking, how do you negotiate with clients if you don't have money as a way to strategize? 
Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. How do you negotiate with clients? Could you clarify that just a little bit? I'll be happy to get into that a little deeper. Um, how do you negotiate with clients if you don't have money as a way to strategize? So when the, okay, so when the client that you're working for is the business that you're working for. Oh, you're an in-house development team. Okay, so, wow. All right, let me make, let me make sure, I'm going to rephrase this and make sure I understand. Okay, so you are an in-house web development team and you are serving, wow, 15 different businesses that are under the umbrella of your business. Is that right? Okay, wow. Okay, first of all, let's have a moment of silence for web team. We appreciate the bind that you're in. <laughs> that is a tough one because you don't have uh, as much leverage to create systems as maybe a freelancer or an agency is and be selective about the clients that you have. I guess the best thing I could tell you to do would be to build out a process that protects you and your team. And then whoever your supervisor is, get them to buy in on that process. You know, whoever it is that you report to, help them explain why you need to do this. And if you, you know, and really the sales pitch, I think would be, you know, if we follow this process, we're gonna be more efficient and more profitable as a unit of this business. So this is how, you know, this is the way we wanna do things and get buy-in from the higher-ups that yes, and you know, get their credence that yes, this is how we're gonna do things. Um, does that help at all? That would be the way I would approach it. But you are in a tough spot there. Yeah. Happy to stay around for any other questions that uh, you have. Please drop those in the questions area of the GoToWebinar control panel. Good, glad that helps. Any other questions at all? Problem clients, look, here, the thing about problem clients is, especially if you're just starting out, the tendency of someone who's just trying to make a little bit of money doing web development is to take on any and every project that comes along. And if I could wrap this up with one more little bit of advice, bad clients are never ever worth it. Even if you think, gosh, I need this money, you know, and, and we've all taken bad clients because we've had to pay the bills, but what I've learned over the years is that whatever money you make from a problem client, it's always going to cost you more in mental and emotional capital that you end up wasting on that problem client. Uh, it, they're just, it's very, very difficult. We'll pause just for one more second here. If there's any last minute questions, drop those in and I'll answer those. And if not, we'll call it quits for today. Again, my name is Nathan Ingram, and thank you for joining us here on this webinar sponsored by Liquid Web, the most helpful humans in hosting.